I thought today had a different name. I got it wrong. I thought it was called Bold and Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought I had at least half of the qualifications for being here, the bald part. After a breast cancer diagnosis in April, I've just finished treatment, so my hairdo is far from perfect, just like me. But it does fit the theme of my talk, the curse of perfect. As a psychotherapist, I've spent the last 33 years in the consulting room. I did come out from time to time for a cup of tea, but I worked much of that time with women. And from that work and from my own life, I discovered that as women, we don't always know what we really want. Is it the career, the partner, the baby, the six-figure salary, the looks, the house, the handbag, the fame, the TED talk? Can we really have it all? I graduated in psychology from Glasgow University in 1980, and I met the handsome prince. We got married until nine months later, he left with another princess. And I was the only person in the entire history of my family to bring the shame of divorce to the family door. Now this word shame, is going to be a major player in our conversation. And we'll see how it can drive us on a cover-up operation that can last a lifetime. I found myself suffering from what the medical profession called clinical depression. I call it a broken heart. My journey back to health involved dealing with issues that may be familiar to many of you, or some of you, as a child, the shame of sexual abuse. As an adult later, the shame of sexual assault. So like you, I've walked through my fair share of dark and lonely woods. My parents' divorce, the experience of miscarriage, the shame of childlessness, the grief of losing my dad to pancreatic cancer, and my own journey with breast cancer all followed. Life is tough. Our life journey is not a trajectory of successfully achieving goals. Regardless of what some of the self-help books tell us, there is no happy land plateau. Life is a journey of circles, of chaos and then calm, of crisis and then stability. We all go through these cycles of dark and light. The externals of our lives are always changing. We all get sick, we get older if we're lucky enough, and we die. And so does everybody else. We are betrayed, often by the people we least expect it from, and these are part of the package in the university of life. Rejection, abandonment, and loss, they're all part of the curriculum. We do these too. Somebody somewhere's in therapy because of us. But with time and effort, we can heal these emotional wounds. Now, the boasting bit. I always get a bit worried about doing this part. I've been very privileged to accompany other people on their journeys of unshaming and healing. I founded the Harvest Clinic here in Glasgow over 30 years ago, which is now home to over a dozen therapists. And at the age of 37, I was ready for a real relationship and met my husband, Graham, the only man in the audience. <laughs> I didn't get to have babies, but I did get two stepchildren without stitches or pain relief. <laughs> and I now have three grandchildren as an added bonus. In the midst of crisis and chaos, we can experience unforgettable moments of grace and light, like the privilege of holding my father's hand as he took his last breath. 
like after my diagnosis, the taste of salty tears on my husband's face as we felt both our fear and our love. Ringing the bell when I had reached the end of my chemotherapy treatment. <laughs> Surrounded by family. Tough times for sure, but these moments of deep connection are up there with the obvious highlights, like holding a newborn grandchild, swimming with dolphins, or graduating from university. Both light and dark transform us. And we need an anchor, a connection to our deepest self in order to navigate our way through. When we're disconnected from our deeper self, we can become codependent. This is where we want to fix and control everything and everybody in order to find a sense of ourselves. We throw ourselves out there without a safety harness, no scaffolding to support us. We burn out, we break down, trying frantically to do it all out there and create the myth of the perfect life. Even the world of personal development and the new age with its goals and sparkle and rainbow colors can be exhausting. Here's an excerpt from my book on the power, sorry, the exhaustion of positivity. Advert. We can overdo positivity and definitely overrate it. We are bombarded on a daily basis on social media by all the happy smiling faces with the saccharine smiles. And yes, before you think it, I've posted a few myself. When we repress so-called negative feelings and emotions, such as fear, sadness, rage, and jealousy, guess where they go? The angels and the unicorns don't carry them off to Planet Sparkle for recycling. No, they go deep into our psyche and our biology, and they live there growling in the basement. So we try to anesthetize these unwanted feelings with alcohol, sugar, spending, punishing exercise regimes, obsessing about our body image, controlling behavior. It's exhausting trying to stay away from these feelings. And they threaten to leak at the most inappropriate times. Now listen, positivity is important and it has its place. Smiling, laughter, lightness of spirit are of huge value, but we repress our negative emotions at our peril. We shame ourselves for having them. We blame other people for having them too. Perfectionism is the curse of the disempowered woman, spinning her plates, playing nice, overextending and over-delivering with increasing resentment and hating herself in the process. This woman bases her worth on her ability to satisfy others' needs and her own relentless demands of herself. The perfect mother helicoptering the kids from class to club. The perfect codependent wife, daughter or employee exhausted and seething somewhere deep inside. A Yale University study linked perfectionism to a higher risk of depression and suicide. One in four women are on antidepressants. Over 200 women took their own lives in Scotland by suicide in 2018. Add in the eating disorders, the drug and alcohol figures. We may be horrified by the way women are treated in other cultures. For example, there's cultures in which women still bind their feet. <laughs> there's the practice of female genital mutilation. We smirk at the idea of Victorian women binding their corsets, suffocating, wanting literally to fit in. My generation were told we could have it all. And back in the 60s, many women burnt their bras to celebrate. But many of us replaced those burnt bras with surgical implants for breasts that would point to the skies. 
Some of us need surgery on our feet to repair the damage done by Western foot binding, crippling high heels. Some women today choose to surgically cut their faces and bodies open in the quest for beauty. How far have we really come? We overwork, we overeat, we overdrink, we overspend, we overthink. We tell ourselves we're too fat, too thin, too old, too stupid. Some of us live lives of quiet desperation, indulging in the national pastime, shopping. Then we go from the soulless shopping centre to the dump to ditch the bootful of stuff that we bought in previous shopping trips. We sleepwalk from the fridge to the TV, which seduces us to revisit the shopping centre. Tells us that we're not okay without the right label, without the newest gadget. Shame. To prove our worth, we push ourselves to burn out or break down. If I just get that job, if I just get that partner, if I just get that hairdo, then I'll be good enough. But that day never comes. It's become clear to me from my own life and my experience as a therapist that we can't have it all. Striving for perfect, we are like hungry ghosts sleepwalking through our lives. Having it all comes at a price. We try to anaesthetise the pain with food, drink, TV, shopping, any distraction will do. Or we create dramas and get over busy. That'll give us somewhere to hang our anxiety and justify it. And the self-loathing keeps us locked in this cycle. I'm messy. You're messy. Life is messy. Messi's not just a good footballer. <laughs> Life will break us more than once. It's not a mistake. In allowing ourselves to accept and sit for a while in the chaos rather than just reacting to it, something deeper in us often shows us a different way. We develop more empathy for others who are also in the dark. We're more connected so we can love more deeply. We need to accept our brokenness. When we accept that we are enough with our lumpy, bumpy, scary, nasty bits, that's the practice of unconditional love. As we face our shadow, the bad and the ugly, we welcome ourselves home. We bring in some compassion when we drop our expectations, add a ladle of forgiveness and a spoonful of humour. And then we have a healing brew of love. Inside of you is a wellspring of passion and of power that has been squashed deep down by shame and the relentless demands of perfect. But that power can be freed up and channeled. That's what we really, really want. Here's a piece I wrote. Sit on the couch, lie on the bed. Stay in and don't change a thing. Release that false grin. Forget the decluttering project and accept your negativity and the brokenness of others. Everyone's trying their best, no matter the distressing disguise. Have a duvet day, but make it luxurious. Wear the good jammies. Light candles in the shower. Have a moan. You're raw. You are not a machine. Avoid anyone or anything that looks like a challenge and oh, avoid positive people like the plague until you resurface. The vagus nerve in our body was only discovered in the 1920s. It's the longest nerve in the body and it's connected to almost every organ and it controls your relaxation response. So when it's activated, it's like having your own comfort blanket to wrap around you. It's your braking system. And it delivers a tranquilizing substance 
it's called acetylcholine, that calms and soothes us. It's actually referred to as the love nerve, and we can hack into it. We also have a love hormone called oxytocin, and it's referred to as the love or cuddle chemical. With practice, we can learn to strengthen this calming, healing part of ourselves deep within. They both respond to the breath, specifically the out-breath, an extended out-breath, and to touch. So, shall we try? Check in with your breathing. Just extend the out-breath by a little longer. No pushing or forcing. No holding the breath. Just breathing out slightly longer than you breathe in. Your vagus nerve is now wrapping you in an invisible, soft, comfort blanket of love. And keep that going, just breathing out slightly longer than in. Now let's add in the heart hug. Cross your arms over your heart and hold, or better still, stroke the outside of your arms from shoulder to elbow. The heart is the center of love. We speak of a broken heart. We talk of things touching the heart. And as a baby, when we were held, we were soothed. We had body contact here on the outer arms when we were held. These are areas of remembered love in our cellular memory. Touch and contact with the heart is soothing and it initiates the vagus nerve. It activates the release of that inner valium and the love hormone. Weave this and the extended out breath into the fabric of your day and receive that self-love. These simple tricks have helped me through a mastectomy, through chemotherapy and through radiotherapy and doing TED Talks. <laughs> to close, the bold and brilliant woman shares from her heart and she does her share. She practices humility. She feels equal to, not better than others. She doesn't carry her self-worth in her handbag or her hairstyle. She's in touch with her vulnerability, her soft place. She knows the healing power of tears. But she will rise as a she-wolf to protect herself and others. She is not static. She waxes and wanes like the moon, connected to her mother nature. She has no need for perfect and knows that comparing herself to anyone is toxic. She knows how to laugh, especially at herself. She remembers who she is. She is love in action. And I'm still a work in progress. Thank you.